Amen, amen. So it's good to be here. It's good to see you guys this morning. Um, it's amazing that when there is load shedding that you guys can get all your kids out of the house and you guys can get here and be on time. Um, all right, fantastic. Okay, Patrick, can you take me down just a little bit? Thank you so much. All right, again, amazing morning. Uh, this is one of my favorite things and, and what's kind of interesting is we think about how to plan a service out and we think about okay what part of the service do we do when this is a bit of behind the scenes for you guys so for most of you like who cares just give us the message but baptisms are so cool and they're so cool because it's someone's like it's their life like they're telling their life story and you're getting to see how Jesus really encounters people in real life it's one thing for me to stand up here on stage and preach it you know every single week because that's kind of what I'm supposed to do But it's another thing for people to come up and say, no, this is really happening in my life. So on days like today, we like to let them tell their story. And that's why we do that. And then I just like listening to you guys worship. So uh, we got to do that a little bit longer as well. So uh, thank you guys so much. You guys are a blessing to me. And I just want to thank you for being so warm and welcoming to those that, you know, had the courage to step into the pool and kind of share their story. So um, I think their story really lined up with what I want to talk about today. Uh, And today we're in week three on this series called Risky Business. And the whole point to the series is about taking risk and about life having some risk involved to it. But today I want to focus on purpose. And purpose is a really unique and special thing because without purpose, many of us feel like we're just floundering. Without purpose, we don't exactly know what we're doing with our life. I don't know. Come on. How many of us feel like from day to day, we're like, what am I doing with my life? Where is my life going? What is my purpose? What is it that I want to do with my life? You know, for some of us, we encounter that when we're 18. I remember being 18. I finished high school and I'm getting ready to go to university. And my parents are saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do for a living? I was like, I have no idea. I knew what my purpose was. My purpose was to build the church and to serve Jesus. But I didn't know how to tie that in with what I wanted to do for for a living. And so what I ended up doing is walking around for years and years and years and not really knowing how to identify my purpose. So I went to university, graduated with a four-year degree in history. And guess what? I couldn't tell you three things about World War I. I don't know anything, even though I spent four years studying it because it wasn't exactly aligned with my purpose. Now, some of us, we have to figure out our purpose before university. Some of us, we have to figure it out, you know, as we try and get jobs. Some of us are 35, 40, 45, 50, 60, 65, somewhere around in there. And we still don't know what our purpose is. And see, I I think there's too many of us that are out there that don't exactly know why we're here and what it is that we're supposed to do here. And so what I hope to do today is I hope to get you thinking. I hope to get you wrapping your head around this idea of why am I here? Am I here to go to work? Am I here to raise my family the way that I'm doing it? Am I here to just trudge through the week, day in and day out, hoping to get to the holiday season so that I can then go away somewhere and relax and then come back and jump back into that daily grind? I I think that there's more for us. I think there's more out there for us. So I I just want to remind you about something about you. See, I love nature. And I I love just getting caught up in the majesty of what God created and what God made. And when I look out the window and I see Table Mountain and I see, you know, the sun rising or or setting behind Table Mountain, especially the sunset on these, uh, these cloudy evenings, it's like, man, that is so beautiful. And then the stars are beautiful and, and, and just you look outside and you just see God's beauty everywhere. But God didn't send Jesus to die for a mountain. And he didn't send Jesus to die for stars in the sky. God didn't send Jesus to die for the beautiful flowers. God sent Jesus to die for you. As much beauty as God put into the world, God put even more of it into you in creating you. And he put even more of it into creating your purpose. Now somebody today needs to hear that. Because you don't find yourself beautiful. You don't find your purpose beautiful. You don't find your soul beautiful or your character, or who you are, or your identity to be a very beautiful thing. You don't think that you're miraculously made. You think that you're barely alive or that you're broken. You don't think that you are uniquely set apart to have this incredible purpose for yourself. Instead, you think that, that 
that all you do is walk around and hurt people or break people or mess this up or cause that to fail. See, there's a huge disconnect between what God made you to be and what you think of yourself as. And in the middle of that, there's this whole big stretch of purpose and identity. Who are you? What were you created with? And so as we go throughout this message today, as I take you on a journey today, I, I want to try and get you to unsubscribe from this lie that we've been thinking about over the last couple weeks. And it's, it's this. The lie is this. It's if, if we risk nothing, then we can lose nothing. So if you don't risk stepping into the uniqueness of your personality or your character, if you don't risk stepping into the uniqueness of your purpose, if you don't risk owning and accepting who you are and how God made you to be, if you don't risk any of that stuff, then there can be no disappointment. There can be no letdown. There can be no accountability on you. You don't have to look at yourself and say, well, I failed at doing this or I didn't quite make it at, at starting this business or, or being who I am or even in a social situation. When you walk into a room, instead of walking in and saying, you know, I tried to say, hey, and instead I farted and I made a bad joke and everyone looked at me. Everyone looked at me funny. You know, the, the, the thing is, is it's not about risking nothing. Because when we risk nothing, we, what we do is we build this enormous bank of regret. And, and we're so worried about what we're going to do when we enter a social situation or what we're going to do when we stand up for ourselves or what we're going to do when we say, you know what, God made me to like this. And even though all my friends think that this is dumb or lame, I'm going to say that I like this thing. You know, it's so hard to stand up to peer pressure. It's so hard to stand up to society's, you know, uh, pressures around everything from fashion to what you do with your life to all of that stuff. Listen, we live in, in a, it's a hard time to live. I understand that. I accept that. But we have to wrap our heads around that this is a lie. If we risk nothing, we lose nothing. When it comes to your purpose and your identity, if you continue to risk nothing, you think you're losing nothing. But actually, you're, you're losing everything because you're missing every opportunity that you have. And so what we do is we develop this thing called a safety box. And the safety box is this thing that we step into and we say, okay, I, I'm afraid to walk in my purpose. I'm afraid to walk in my calling. I'm afraid to walk in my identity. And so I'm going to mute all of those things. And I'm going to step into this, this box that I've created for myself. And this is a safe place. And, and if I get courage and I step out of it, and, and I make that silly statement or people look at me funny. And th you know what? I can just retreat back into my safety box. And I, I can just find comfort in there. And I can never kind of push the envelope. I can, never, um, I can never risk anything because in this place I'm safe. Guys, today we've done this every week and every week this has happened. But today I want some people to get free from their safety box. I want some people to break out of what you think is a safety box, but what is actually a jail or prison that's holding you back. And so we're going to look at a guy named Peter, and we're going to look at Peter's journey to finding purpose. Now, I realize this sentence right here is a sentence that would make me turn my brain off if I were sitting in a congregation like this. But Peter's journey to finding purpose, this is a, this is a real journey. Peter is a real guy just like you. I want you to connect with him. I want you to identify with him. I want to show you where Peter is, uh, where he fails, where he has his faults. I want to show you where Peter struggles with his purpose and with his identity. See, Peter goes on this journey, and I think that we can absolutely relate to this journey. And Peter shows us that it's okay to fail and try and try and try again. And so I'm going to take us through Peter's story. And as I do, we're going to pause along the way, and we're going to connect ourselves with his story. And so the first place that we're going to start with Peter is we're going to start with Peter's first calling. So what I mean by this is this is the first time that Jesus called Peter to be a disciple. And so the backstory uh, to this part of the scripture before we get into it, which is in, in John 1, is that John the Baptist had, had been baptizing people. 
And John had all these people that were following him. And so Jesus comes down to get baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is like, whoa, I can't baptize you. You're the savior of the world. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you've got to do this because we've got to fulfill the prophecy and set an example. And basically Jesus is like, hey, just do this thing. I need you to do it. And so John baptizes him. So now Jesus is walking around. And John the Baptist has all these disciples, these guys that are following him and learning what he's been teaching. And a couple of those disciples, when they see Jesus, and they say, well, wait a minute, if Jesus is who John says he is, like the Messiah, which is this kind of generic term that they use for, uh, for Savior, the one that was going to save them or release them or set them apart, but Jesus was the Messiah. And these guys said, yeah, I, think, I think we're going to jump off of John and we're going to go follow this Jesus guy. And so that's the first encounter with, between Jesus and his potential disciples. And so it starts here. So one of the two who heard what John said, so again, they were listening to John because they were John's disciples. And then they hear what John said, and as a result, followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So imagine John is there, he's got his disciples, Jesus walks by, and all the disciples follow him him instead like a honey pot and they they look and one of them is Andrew and Andrew is Simon Peter's brother now Peter's the guy we're talking about but at the time his name is Simon and so Simon Peter or Andrew Simon's brother he he follows Jesus and then after he follows Jesus in verse 41 he first looked for and found his own brother Simon and told him we have found the Messiah so here Andrew goes and gets his brother and says we've got the Messiah so now, in the next verse, we see in verse 41 or 42, Andrew brings Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him. He looks at Simon. Just like Jesus will look at you right now, if you're in, if you're in church and you believe Jesus is here in this room, which I believe that he is, I hope he is, or else we're in big trouble. <laughs> Jesus is looking at you just like he looked at Simon. And when he looks at Simon, he says, you are Simon, son of John. He says, I know you. I know exactly who you are. So Jesus is saying, I know you. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So right there, Jesus renames Simon to become Peter. Now, why does he do that? Why is that important? Because when Jesus renamed something or when someone ad adopted a new name, their kind of ownership changed. So Jesus is saying, okay, I'm claiming you as one of mine. And what I mean by that is Jesus was a rabbi. And these rabbis were kind of, they, they were teachers and they had disciples that followed them. And in order to be a disciple of a rabbi, you had to go to the rabbi and you had to ask, hey, can I follow you? Can I study under you? Can I learn under you? And then the rabbi would say, okay, do you qualify? And they would make a decision and let you come and do that. But here we have Andrew and Simon they're not following another rabbi. In fact, we're going to learn that they're fishermen. The reason they're fishermen is they're not good enough to be chosen by another rabbi. They're leftovers. These are the people that couldn't make it in Jewish society. They weren't chosen by anyone else. So what did they do? They went back to work for their parents. They moved back in with mom and dad. All their other friends went off to college partied and hung out with other Jewish rabbis and here they are moving in with mom and dad working the family business out on a fishing boat and then they come up and they meet Jesus and Jesus chooses Peter he says he doesn't wait for Peter to say can I follow you Jesus says I'm renaming you therefore I'm choosing you will you come follow me so Jesus immediately flips this thing around and so that's the first time that Peter is called to a purpose and that purpose would be following Jesus so now we look at the second calling so when we get to the second calling of Peter Peter the reason there's a second calling is because the first calling didn't work it didn't stick so after Peter and Jesus had this encounter Jesus would go off and he would spend the 40 days fasting in the desert and in that time him and, and Satan were in kind of a wrestling match and Satan was trying to tempt him and Jesus was standing strong and, and he was you know rebuking Satan and all this stuff and meanwhile guess what happens Peter has completely abandoned his calling and so Jesus disappears for 40 days and then he comes back and guess what he's walking along the shore 
This is, I, I, like to, I want you to think of this like, like this is normal. This isn't Bible. Take Bible out of this and think about this as like a story like you'd see on YouTube or Netflix or something. So you imagine Jesus been gone for 40 days. And he comes back and he's like, I'm going to catch up with my disciples and we're going to see how life's going. And I've been teaching them because guess what? Peter had been with Jesus for a year. So a year, Peter had been following Jesus. Jesus disappears 40 days. And Peter is like, you know what? I, man, Jesus is gone. I don't know when he's coming back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to what I know. So let's, let's look what happens in the second calling. In, in Matthew 4, 18, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, so he comes out of his 40 days, and he's just, just taking a walk on the beach, you know? You guys can identify with that in, in Cape Town. Walking on the beach. Jesus walking around. And he noticed two brothers. Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. And they're casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So I want to highlight something to you here. Their identity was fishermen. Simon and Andrew identified as fishermen. Their identity and their purpose are not aligned. Their identity is fishermen because that's what they know. So as soon as life gets hard, as soon as life gets weird, as soon as Jesus disappears, what do they do? They go back to their default identity of a fisherman. So all of us, what is your default identity? Is your default identity a loser? Is your default identity a drunk? Is your default identity an abuser? Is your default identity uh, an abusee? Is your default identity lonely? Is it prideful? Is your default identity not enough? Is your default identity a victim? What is your default identity? What do you go back to? As soon as the, the, the hoorah and, and everything of all your friends and of Jesus and, and the church, I mean, imagine you come in here on Sunday morning and you get pumped up by great worship and, and our band did such a good job and you're pumped and you're pumped and you're ready to go and you're ready to charge the work day and then Monday comes around and church kind of fades off into the distance and you don't have a good community around you and when that community doesn't reach out to you and you don't get a WhatsApp message or something like that, we default. We go back to what? Our identity was what we think our identity was. And that's what they've done. They said, no, we're fishermen. That's, that's who we are. And so Jesus, because he never gives up on us, he says in verse 19, he says, he said to them, hey, follow me as my disciples accepting me as your master and teacher walking the same path of life that I walk. Jesus is like, hey, what are you doing? Get over here. Come follow me. It's like talking to, you know, a dog. Come on, get over here right now. Come follow me. Some moms and parents in the room just have flashbacks to your children. Ah! Come here right now. So, so Jesus does that. And then what he tells them is so important. He gives them a new identity. He says, no, no, no. You think your identity is fisherman, but actually I'm going to make you a fisher of men. So what Jesus has done here is he's defined their purpose. He said, your identity was that you thought you were a fisherman, but actually your purpose is, is that you're going to be a fisher of men. And see, when Jesus comes to you, and he comes to you on a Sunday morning, when he comes to you on a Tuesday night when you're in a Bible study, or when he comes to you and you're alone, and you're laying in bed, and you're staring at the ceiling, and you're wondering if there's even a God above, if you'll take a second and you'll let him come to you and let him call you, whether he's called you once or twice or three times or a hundred times, if you just listen, Jesus will call you by your purpose. And it's exactly what he does to these two men. He says, I will make you fishers of men. I will give you your purpose. And so after that, Jesus goes on in Matthew 4 here in verse 20. Immediately, this is what they did because the, apparently this was good enough. <laughs> and because of that, immediately they left their nets and they followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example, just like Jesus had asked them to do. Now, because Peter is so real and we can really identify with him, because he has a hard head just like us, because he has a calloused heart just like us, because he needs things to make sense just like we need things to make sense, because he needs things to follow a timeline just like we need things to follow a timeline, Peter, he walks away again. 
And there has to be a third calling of Peter. There has to be a third time that Jesus comes and Jesus speaks to him and gets him. See, what happens here is Peter has now been called to Jesus twice. And then we come across another story in the Bible where Jesus is actually hanging out at Peter's mom's house. And he's in Peter's mom's house. And in verse 38 in Luke 4, then Jesus got up and left the synagogue and he went to Peter's house. So while Jesus is doing stuff, now obviously Peter and Jesus are close enough that Jesus was staying in his house. And so Simon's mother, which is Peter, his mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. You know, this is Jesus has compassion on mother-in-laws. Obviously, Peter had just left his mother-in-law to be sick. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I will just, you know, she's fine. Just lock, shut and lock the door. Jesus is like, wait a minute. No, we can't do it. So Jesus has compassion. And so Peter's mother-in-law is suffering from this super high fever. And, and they ask Jesus to help her. And so Jesus, he does this in verse 39. Standing over her, Jesus rebuked the fever. So Jesus is showing that he's got power and ability over things that we don't understand. Jesus can command the body. He can command sickness to enter and sickness to leave. Jesus is saying, I'm Lord of everything. I'm Lord of all in your life. There's nothing in your life that I'm not Lord over. And so Jesus takes authority over her life and he commands the sickness to leave. The fever leaves and immediately, I love that the Bible uses that word, she... She pops up and she got up and she began serving them as her guests. That means that she had strength. She didn't get up and just waver. She didn't get up and need a nap. She got up and she had strength in her. And she immediately went to doing what, what she wanted to do, which is serve them. And so this is happening in Peter's house. And meanwhile, while this has happened in Peter's house, we find that Peter is no longer following Jesus. So now it happened that while Jesus was standing by the lake of uh, Gesenaret, Sea of Galilee, so imagine Jesus heals Peter's mom, he leaves the house, and he goes back to the lake, and there's a whole bunch of people that are pretty amazed at what Jesus can do, and so this whole crowd gathers around Jesus, and while they gather around Jesus, Jesus looks around at the shore, and guess what he sees? He sees that with the people crowding around him, they're listening to the word of God, that he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. Now, here's what Jesus is doing. He's worried about the acoustics. He wants to make sure people hear him. And so he says, I've got to get myself to a place where everyone can hear me and see me. And there's too many people around. So he looks and he says, ah, oh, there's a boat here. So he sees two. Clever enough, Jesus picks the one that belongs to Simon. And we'll see that in the next verse here. But the fishermen, so this is Simon and Andrew, and I'm saying Simon because he's acting like a Simon. He's not acting like, an, uh, like a Peter. So Simon, the fisherman, had gotten out of them and they were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's boat, and he asked him to put out a little distance from the shore. And then he sat down and he began teaching the crowds from the boat. So why was Simon cleaning the nets? When he should have been following Jesus. See, Simon had already drifted from Jesus yet again. Maybe he's mad that he healed his mother-in-law. I don't know. But what's another important thing for me here in this verse is, is he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. This is like, uh, it's important that it says Simon's boat and not Peter's boat. It's like, uh, they want you to know that he's acting like a Simon. He's not acting like a Peter. See, to act like a Peter, he's acting like someone called into a purpose. But he's acting like a Simon, which is someone that's falling back on their identity, falling back on that default identity. And so here we see again, one of the greatest figures in the Bible, Peter. We watch him again fall back on his default identity. So Jesus gets into this boat. And he goes out from shore a little bit and he begins teaching. And then we, we see in the next verse, when he had finished speaking, he says to Simon, who is Peter, he says, hey, hey, buddy, fisherman, you think you're a fisherman? Your identity is a fisherman? Well, I'm going to just embarrass you. He says, put out your net into deep water and lower your nets, uh, lower your nets for a catch of fish which is kind of absurd at the time because there were only two species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. Both those species of fish only fished at night. 
It didn't happen during the day. And here it is, daytime. Jesus is telling them, hey, go put your nets out. You know what I think Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, Simon, your identity is so small, it's wrapped around two species of fish and a lake. That, that's where you've put your identity, and I want more for you. There's more for you than just two fish in a lake. There's much more for you than that. And so in order to convince you that there's more for you than two fish in a lake, I'm going to completely break down this thing that you think is your identity. So Simon thinks his identity is fishing. And he fishes at night because that's when the fish bite. And there's two kinds of fish that can bite, and that's it. Simon has a very simple identity. I fish at night. There's two kinds of things that will bite. That's it. And so Jesus comes and he unravels the whole thing. So in the middle of the day, Jesus says, throw your nets out. And Simon replies, Master, we worked hard all night. We've done this to the point of exhaustion. And we caught absolutely nothing in our nets. Jesus is probably thinking, well, that's the point. Because your default identity will always lead you to wanting more and needing more. Your default identity will always lead you to a place in your life where you're sitting on the shore cleaning your nets and wondering why that thing that you were trying to do isn't working for you anymore. See, Simon's identity as a fisherman didn't work. It was broken. And it was broken because Jesus had spoken purpose into his life. So if you find yourself in, in a place where your identity, who you think you are, what you think you are is no longer working, then maybe you've got to look and see, has Jesus defined a purpose in my life? And if he's spoken a purpose in your life, then be thankful that your identity's broken. Be thankful that the nets come up empty. Be thankful that the fish aren't biting. Be thankful that everything you know and the way that you think it should work is no longer working. Because that means that God's trying to turn your life upside down and get your attention to show you that he has a bigger purpose for you. Your life is bigger than a lake with two fish in it. And he shows them this here. And in verse 7, so they signal to their partners. Well, I'll back up a little bit. Peter says, but at your word, I will. Peter's always good at being obedient. We looked at Peter walking on water last week. And Peter says, hey, you call me and I'll come. So Peter could obey. He knew how to obey. So he says, at your word, I'll do it. I'll do as you say and I'll lower the nets again. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their nets were at the point of breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. Jesus has unraveled everything that they know. And then in verse 8, he goes on to say, But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Simon, I think at this moment, felt it. He felt my identity is no longer what I need to put my purpose in. I need to put my purpose in what God has spoken my purpose to be. And he repents. He says, Jesus, I can't even be around you. Because everything I am, the fabric of who I am, everything that I know has now unraveled. None of it makes sense to me anymore and I can't, I can't even be in front of you. And so he cries out to Jesus and Jesus responds in the next verse. He says, and so were James and John, sons of Zebedee. So these are Peter's fishing partners who were also disciples. And so Jesus said to Simon, to Peter, have no fear. From now on, you will be catching men. So he reinforces, his, he reinforces his purpose to him. And then in verse 11, Jesus says, After they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So here they, ha here they have left it all, and they follow Jesus. So Peter called three times a new purpose. Called three times to drop his identity. Told three times, chased down by Jesus. Three times. You'd think Peter would be good, but he's not. See, Peter, again, somebody we can identify with. If you're sitting in your seat saying, you know what? I have turned to Jesus 10 times and I just can't do it again because I feel so guilty. I feel like such a phony. I feel like such a sham. You know what? I'm just going to accept that I'm not good at this follow Jesus thing. And I'm just going to get through this service and I'm going to go home and I'm going to try and be a little bit better. But I'm not going to put my hand up and say, Jesus, I'm with you. I accept the purpose that you've spoken over my life. And I'm going to let myself become who you want me to become. If you find yourself just too afraid to do that because of the number of times that you've done that and it didn't stick, I want you to remember what we're about to look at in Peter right now. Because after Peter's called three times, after he's seen Jesus do many miracles, Peter is going to betray Jesus. 
And we look at this, this betrayal of Jesus, where, where Peter has an opportunity to align himself with Jesus, but he doesn't. And so we look at Luke chapter 22 as we unpack what happens with Peter here. And so now in this setting, you have Peter sitting at the, Lord's, at the, at the Last Supper at the table with the Lord. And they're, they're, they're sitting there and this is the final meal and Jesus is explaining what's about to happen to them and the disciples are around and it's just this famous holy moment. And in this moment, you've got Peter who at this time is sitting at the table saying, I am walking in my purpose. I will not lose that purpose. I will stand for you, Jesus, uh, all the way to death. And Jesus screams at Peter almost in a re- rebuking way. He says, Simon... Simon Peter, listen. Listen to me. Satan has demanded permission to sift all of you like grain. But I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your faith and confidence in me may not fall. It may not fail. See, Jesus says that Satan has, uh, has demanded permission to sift all of the disciples. And Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm praying for you specifically. I'm praying specifically for you. You know, again, I want to pause and I want you to take comfort in that. If you feel like you have abandoned your purpose and abandoned Jesus and abandoned whatever over and over and over and over again, I just want you to know that you still sit under a Lord that prays for you specifically. And Jesus actually has sent the Holy Spirit, which is a helper for us. And the helper actually goes to the throne room of God for us. And when we don't know what to pray for ourselves, it actually petitions God on our behalf. And so whether you're good or whether you're bad, whether you follow Jesus or whether you don't, whether you walk in your identity or whether you walk in your purpose, whether you default to what you shouldn't default to, or whether you claim what Jesus has for you, whether, you, whether you've got it figured out or whether you don't, you still serve a Jesus who says, I will especially pray for you that your faith and confidence may not fail. So he gives Peter this encouragement and then he goes on in the next verse and he says, And you, once you have turned back again to me, strengthen and support your brothers in the faith. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Of course he would. This is a charged moment. This is like one of those great uh, motivational videos that you see come through on Facebook and YouTube where the music is perfect and everything's you know, set up well and he's got goosebumps and Peter's sitting at the table and he's got goosebumps and Jesus has just said, I'm praying for you and we're going to take down Satan and his kingdom. And Peter says, yeah, I will go to, the, to prison for you. I will go to death for you because that's my purpose. And then Jesus says to him, he says, Peter, before the rooster crows today, You will utterly deny me three times. You will deny that you even know me. And Peter would do that. Peter, after being pursued three different times, Peter would go on he would deny Jesus three times. Jesus would would go to the garden to pray. Peter would sleep instead of stay awake. Jesus said, Peter, stay awake and pray for me. Peter sleeps. Jesus wakes him again. Please pray for me. Peter sleeps. Jesus said, come on, Peter. I need your prayer. Pray for me. Then Jesus gets arrested. Peter, you know, he gets upset. He cuts the ear off of, a, off of a Roman soldier. He's got all this machizo kind of just, yeah, this is me. He's got all that in him. But when, when it actually comes time to put it to the test, guess what? One of the times that Peter denies Jesus is to a little girl. This little girl is saying, hey, haven't I seen you with him? And Peter's like, no. I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, he uses a cuss word. And he says, absolutely not. I'm emphasizing the fact that I don't have anything to do with this Jesus guy. And so Peter has, has betrayed Jesus three times. Jesus is hung on a cross and died. And guess what? Peter has gone back to his default identity. In fact, all the disciples had. Every single one of them. But fortunately, Jesus doesn't leave him there and so we look at how Peter is found and and this is this is the last most amazing part for us today and we'll finish with this but Peter gets found but let's let's see this unfold in John 21 so here you have Jesus has died 
They don't know that he's resurrected. But Jesus died and all the disciples went back to their default identity. And here's, here's the proof of that. So Simon Peter and Thomas, who is called Didymus, the twin, and Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. So all the bros are together. They're all hanging out. As well as John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples, they were all together. So all, the whole gang is together. And they're sitting around and Jesus is gone. And guess who pipes up with an idea? It's Simon. So Simon Peter says to them, hey, you know what? I'm going fishing. Hey, you know what? This purpose, forget it. You know what? This whole purpose that was spoken over me, forget it. Those three times that Jesus pursued me and called me to him, forget it. Because this dude is dead, and I don't see anything happening here. And it, it's not working out the way I thought it would work out. It's not coming together the way I thought it would come together. Come on, can we identify with this in our own life? Can you look at Monday and see that Monday's not going to work the way you think it's going to work? Can you see that the kids aren't going to behave the way that you think they should behave? Can you see the disappointments in your life, maybe your marriage or your job or your other relationships, aren't coming together the way that you thought that they would come together? Hey, I gave my life to Jesus. I got baptized. I followed Jesus. I accepted my purpose. And now for some reason, it still isn't coming together. You know what? Swipe it. Swipe right. Get rid of it. And so Peter does that. He says, I'm going fishing. And then the rest of them said, cool, we'll go fishing as well. Go back one verse for us, Karina. And so they said, we'll come with you. So they went out and they got in the boat. And guess what? They caught absolutely nothing that night, which is that good. That's what they deserve. That's fitting for them. So not only are they moping, but then they go fishing moping, and then they catch nothing. And so now they're moping, they're upset, and they're empty-handed. And the thing that they thought they knew how to do best isn't working again. Again, the identity that they've defaulted to is not serving the purpose that they want it to serve. They're coming up empty-handed. And so imagine they're on the boat and their nets are completely empty. They're disheartened. And then all of a sudden, as morning comes in verse 4, we read this incredible thing happens to them. As morning was breaking, Jesus, he came and he stood on the beach. However, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And if you don't know the story, just to let you know, Jesus has resurrected. He's come out of the grave. And now Jesus is doing this, this tour where he's going around and he's appearing to different people. And so Jesus comes out and he appears to them. And so Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish to eat along with your bread? And they answered to him, no, because we caught nothing. We have no fish. And so then in the next verse, and he said to them, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat, starboard, and you will find some. So they cast the net and they're not able to haul in the fish because the catch is so great. So Jesus, again, he blows their mind in the middle of the day. And then, man, I, I wish I could unpack more of this story for you, but we're so short on time. But let me tell you how this story ends. Okay, Jesus invites them to shore. And when he invites them to shore, Peter is so excited because he sees Jesus that he jumps off the boat and he dives and he swims about 100 meters to shore. And the boat is coming behind him, dragging the catch and when Peter gets on shore, Jesus is sitting there around a charcoal fire. Now, Jesus uh, is sitting there and he's got this fire. And when Peter smells the charcoal, I, I wonder if Peter has a flashback because the last time Peter smelled charcoal, he was denying Jesus in front of a little girl. And now in front of a charcoal fire, he's got Jesus who's trying to restore him. And so Jesus sets a breakfast aside for them and he feeds them. And then there's this conversation that they have. And in this conversation, Jesus looks at Peter and he says three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I do. And when he says, I do, Jesus says, go and feed my sheep. Then he says, Peter, do you love me? So there's one denial counted out. Then he says, Peter, do you love me? And, G and, and Peter says, Jesus, I do. I do love you. And so Jesus says, okay, now go and feed my sheep. Go and tend my sheep. And then a third time, he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, God, you know me. You know my heart. You know my inside. You know my outside. Of course it is that I love you. And then Jesus says, again, I want you to go and I want you to tend my sheep. 
And so what, what's happening is three times Jesus is saying, do you, do you love me? Because I want you to know that all you have to do is just accept my love for you and love me. It doesn't matter whether you did it right or you did it wrong, but do you love me? You can come to me. You can keep coming to me. And three times he says, I love you, I love you, I love you. And every time Jesus does something so important, he reinforces his purpose. And so the last thing I'll leave you for here, Karina, you can put the very last slide up here. I've got a couple things for you guys to think about. What is my purpose? And does my current identity fit my purpose? And so before I pray for us and before the band comes out to to sing uh, one more quick song, and before you go out there and life gets crazy, and before all of that happens out there, I, I just want you to pause and take some time to think about these two things right here. What is my purpose? And does my identity, does my default identity fit with that purpose. And you know what? If there's tension here, then, then you probably could do a lot of good to ask Jesus. Say, Jesus, what's my purpose? And then I just want you to know, and I hope that you believe that as we've looked at Peter and his life, that you can never disqualify yourself from Jesus speaking your purpose over you. And so let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much.